Welcome to episode 81 of Oscar Sunday. I'm Austin Johnson. I'm Connor Izagari. And today we will be going all over the place, just like Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse from 2018. That film won Best Animated Feature Film at the 91st Academy Awards and completely blew my mind back when I saw it in theaters three years ago now, which is crazy. Uh, we're going to give awards out to that movie later on, but we have a few things I would like to talk about before all of that. Um, that's it, it was uh, Spider Verse was only up for animated feature at one, so there's not a lot to talk about with the 91st Academy Awards. Um, but we do have a lot to talk about from the past week that you and I had. Uh, first off, uh, if you know it's it's Sunday, I feel like a lot of people have seen No Way Home. <laughs> Uh, you and I got to both see it Friday night. Uh, you, you saw it, I believe, at Alamo Draft House. Yeah. Uh, and I saw it at the uh, Santicos uh, Silverado 16, which is a theater I hadn't been to in a long time. It is a gorgeous theater now; has been completely redone here in San Antonio, and it is. It was. It, it was a wonderful experience. It seems like across the board, everyone is receiving it, receiving it uh, very well, and has lots of positive things to say about it. People are raving about it. It was the first time that we've had an event like this since Endgame, I would say. And it's cool that Marvel is just straight up back on top and in, in, in fine fashion, you know, with movies like West Side Story not doing what it was supposed to do at the box office. The box office is back because of Marvel with, with this movie. And, and just <laughs> what a fucking film. I mean, this, this, was, this was a... A true event, you know, a lot leading up to it, right? You know, uh, we have the, you know, the uh, Spider-Man Homecoming from 2017 and then uh, Far From Home in 2019, both good movies. I wouldn't say great, but both solid movies and, and did their job in kind of raising, raising the stakes and raising the tone as we went along. And now this film is, No Way Home is, is shattering. <laughs> it is, it is uh, nothing like I've seen before within this genre. It, you know, encapsulates, encapsulates uh, 20 years of Spider-Man movies from the Raimi trilogy to the two Amazing Spider-Mans to the Tom Holland Spider-Mans now, the trilogy directed by all, all three directed by John Watts. And, and it was, it was mind boggling to watch this two and a half hour movie that went by like nothing because every second is so much fun. Uh, I, we're, we're not going to go too, too deep into it. Because tomorrow's episode of Sneak Preview, uh, Connor and Caleb are going to be talking about all things uh, No Way Home and really, really diving in, doing a lot of spoilers and stuff. We'll try to keep it spoiler free here on Oscar Sunday, but I do want to get, Connor, your general thoughts and your general reaction to, to this incredible film. It's been so long since I experienced a film like this with a packed theater all there mm. for the same reason. You know, cheering independently of one another, but, you know, still together at certain moments of the movie that we all just knew were something we've never seen before. Uh, a feat like this, a film that does so much to change the game and pulls it off, unreal. I mean, you need the first, you know, 25, 26 Marvel, um, MCU films just to even attempt to make something like this. Like you need to prove mm. that you are, you know, good at this. And F Kevin Feige has continually proven his uh, loyalty to these characters and his desire to make movies that fans will celebrate for generations. And Spider-Man No Way Home may be the, the definitive Spider-Man movie and one of the greatest superhero films ever made. Um, one of the greatest films ever made. This is a monumental achievement, a infectiously fun movie. And like you said, celebrates 20 years of Spider-Man. Uh, enough said, as Stan Lee would say, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it, it was, it was jaw dropping and all of the reveals were just incredible. All of the big moments, the emotional moments, they all, they all were very worth it. And, and it's a, it's a film I, I can't wait to see again and I can't wait to own, uh, and, and just talk about for years and decades to come, you know, it's, it's, it really is a true classic. If you haven't seen it 
and you're, you know, you know, of course, if you're a Marvel fan, you're going to get around to it. You know, that's, that's unquestionable. It's one of the most anticipated movies of all time. Uh, but if you're like skeptical at all, or you're not a huge fan of these movies, or you're just kind of like, uh, you're kind of out on all the Disney plus shows and stuff, go see this, uh, uh, do yourself a favor and see, this is the, this is the, like, this is like the, the fucking Super Bowl. This is like, th- it's worth it. Even if you don't have all of the context, right. It's yeah. still, it, it, it's not, I don't want to say it's dumbing anything down because if you do know all the stuff and you watch all, you know, you watch the WandaVisions and, and the Lokis and all that shit, you, you very much are rewarded for those things with this movie. But even if you don't watch all that stuff and you're not totally in the know, it's still worth it. It's still such an entertaining and wonderful film with all these great actors, you know, and I don't, you know, again, don't want to give anything away because uh, if, if you haven't seen it, I, I just, I, I just really encourage people to check it out. If you're a bit skeptical, I don't think it needs a lot of encouragement because I think people are, are getting out. Get, they're going to the theater, you know, like, like, like you said, your, your theater is packed. My theater is packed. Everyone I've talked to, they were like, people were going fucking bonkers, you know, the whole film, you know, screaming and clapping and crying. And it was just like, what is this? This is crazy. And, and while I wish, you know, all movies were like that, it's just not the case. It's not the case. You know, you see a lot of movies where it's there, there's 10 people in the theater. There's just you in the theater. It's just, just, you know, maybe 50 people, depending on, depending on what the, what the event is, but this was yeah, completely packed sold out hard to find seats anywhere uh especially at the theaters i was looking at here in san antonio i was like holy shit um which brings me to our, our the next next thing i want to talk about is the week you and i had leading up to seeing spider-man so we both saw it on friday night uh the day before uh thursday you and i got back from los angeles california uh and <laughs> And that was that was a hell 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 of a hell of a trip. And we're gonna talk talk about our our few days there and kind of what we experienced, what we got to do, because we also saw three movies while we were there, uh, and just kind of consumed movie stuff for three straight days. So that was a lot of fun. But you and I, I remember when we were finally getting back, uh, like on Thursday night, we were driving back from the Austin airport uh, back into back into San Antonio and we were both like, fuck, I kind of wish we were seeing it tonight, you know, Spider-Man, but we were so tired. <laughs> we, we knew we needed all of the energy we could muster to see, to see this movie. So we both, you know, a lot of people saw it Thursday. Uh, we saw it Friday and I, I just, I just had such a blast, but Los Angeles. Uh, I'll start by saying, you know, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot to kind of get to here with why we did this trip and what, what, what our intentions were going there. Uh, I, I want to say, in 2018, probably around when Spider-Verse came out, like around November, December, uh, you and I were just kind of talking and I stumbled upon um, the fact that Quentin Tarantino has his own theater in Los Angeles called the New Beverly Cinema. And I was like, dude, we have to go there. Like, We, we just absolutely have to find our way to this place, right? It's, it's something we got to do. Like, yeah, of course. And why not go to LA? You know, one of the one of the coolest cities in the world, one of the biggest cities in the world. And when you're a movie fan, there's just so many things to do. So we kind of use that as a as a tent pole of all right, we want to go there, we want to go to this theater, we want to see Quentin Tarantino's, you know, kind of niche theater. And that was amazing. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But then we found out that the uh the academy was opening up a museum for motion pictures honoring all 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 things movies and we're like well fuck we have to go to that and then you know some time passed and the 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 museum got postponed you know their opening got postponed and then of course covid happened in 2020 and we were like fuck man i don't know when we're gonna do this but we both knew we're going to go at some point right and uh covid still is very much alive and and is is you know kind of taking taking on a whole new wave right now, as we've seen all over the world, there's different things happening, but we both are uh, vac- double vaccinated, both of us. And we are like, it's time, like, it's time to go. We just got to do this, you know? Uh, and I was able to get some time off of work. You were, you're on break for school. Uh, 
So it, it, it just kind of, the stars fi- finally aligned. So we flew in on Monday morning. Um, we flew from straight from Austin to, to Los Angeles. And we immediately uh, took an Uber to our hotel. Uh, we stayed at the Best Western uh, on North, North Highland Avenue, very close to the Walk of Fame, about a mile away. <clears throat> and uh, uh, a lot of, a lot of, that's a central area, you know, in Hollywood for a lot of, a lot of things that we're both interested in. So it was, it was, it was honestly perfect where we stayed was in walking distance of a lot of places and close to the new Beverly, uh, close to the fucking Fox theater, which I'll, we'll talk about soon. Uh, and we just started walking around, you know, we we're, we were just curious what's, what's around here. And we, like the first thing we did was go to Roscoe's <laughs> Ros- Roscoe's chicken and waffles. It's about a mile and a half from where our hotel was. We just walked there and got some food, just kind of relaxed for a second and just kind of figured out what's our, what our plan was for the, for the next couple of days. And then after that, we started walking around some more. And then we stumbled upon the most incredible record store slash movie store slash CD store slash pop culture store I've ever been to called Amoeba. There are three locations, one in Hollywood, uh, right on the Walk of Fame, which is the one we went to one in Berkeley and one in San Francisco. That place was a fucking just, it was a total dream. And you and I were like, uh, we have to hold our horses here because we could spend about $4,000 on fucking DVDs. (laughs) And, and I, I know speaking for myself, I just was, uh, I was like impaled by, (laughs) by the amount of stuff that was there. It is giant. And if you look up on the internet, uh, best record stores in, in, in the country. Amoeba is like right up at the top. So we just kind of stumbled in there and we were like, Oh, we're, we're home. <laughs> it was so cool. Picture the scene in Willy Wonka and the chocolate factory. When mm-hmm. the kids finally get to experience the chocolate room where all the candy and everything's made of candy and chocolate and everyone goes berserk while Gene Wilder sings pure imagination. That is what it was like walking into Amoeba Music for the first time. We felt like we'd stumbled onto a, something amazing, a, a record store the size of like a small grocery store. Yeah. It was unreal. Separate, like the films were separated by director. I've never seen that before. Yeah. And I was so jazzed. Like that was such a cool idea. Um, we, we went there three separate times on this. Trip. Yeah. <laughs> and, all we had to keep rest- on in one occasion we like nearly ran through hollywood to try to get there before closing and we got there 10 minutes before closing and had to make some decisions <laughs> yeah 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 that, that, yeah I, we're gonna get to that that was the that was the next day uh after going to amoeba we kept walking around the walk of fame you know looking at the stars and stuff oh there's chris farley oh there's oh there's you know uh fucking Betty Davis, you know, it just like people all over the place that we both are, you know, just jazzed to see their names and having a lot of fun. And then we uh, knew we had a, a long day ahead of us uh, on Tuesday. So we walked back to our hotel. Uh, we stopped by, grabbed some waters, grabbed some sodas. And, you know, we were full off the, that Roscoe's chicken and waffles, which is just a wonderful establishment, really cool place. And uh, w- went back to the hotel and just decided to kind of chill out. We recorded our Spider-Man episode for film for the Film Guys and Podcast uh, that night, and then we watched <laughs> we watched Home Alone Two: Lost in New York City on Freeform. We basically watched it straight through, <clears throat> and then after that ended, we uh, flipped some channels and then we found Creed on TNT, and we basically watched that movie entirely and uh, just had a blast, just kind of chilling. We were like, these movies are amazing. We couldn't. It was hard for us to go to sleep because we were like, there's just Anytime you and I catch a movie at the beginning, we're like, oh, well, fuck. <laughs> I guess we're going to watch the whole thing. It was hard for us. We, we ended up um, stumbling upon Scarface about 20 minutes in, and we were like, we need to stop. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to be up till fucking 5 a.m. just watching movies. And we knew, again, we had a long day ahead. So finally, we went to bed, uh, and then we woke up the next day about 9 o'clock. And uh, our first stop that day was the Academy Museum. And, oh my God, you know, uh, both of us, both of us, you know, again, we were vaccinated, had our, had our vaccination cards. We had to give those to, to, to the uh, people that were taking our tickets and whatnot. And so we did that and we both 
avoided kind of looking things up about the museum, about what it, what it's all about, what they exactly do there, what, 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 is, what exactly is represented. I expected, and I said this while we were walking around, I was like, I expected this to be an, like an Oscar stroke fest and for them to be like, we are the most important. What we think is, is all and end all be all. That is just so far from the truth. So far from the truth. This museum is like, doesn't even need to be called the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures. It's just the Museum of Motion Pictures. They're, they're shouting out movies that they didn't recognize. Uh, there was a full mannequin of, uh, of the dude from the Big Lebowski with his cardigan on and his shorts and his fucking sandals. And they didn't give that movie one nomination. You know, it was things like that were there. And we were kind of like, damn, this is cooler than we thought it was going to be. We knew it was going to be fun because we love the Oscars. You know, we're, we're, we're doing, we do our own show, Oscar Sunday, every, every single week. And we love some of the things they've done. Also have our, our gripes. But this was kind of a, a, a mixture of both those worlds, right? It was just movies in general. There was an entire sci-fi wing with costumes and different little things. And there was TV screens playing all these different sci-fi movies. And we were like, fuck man, this is really cool. Like, and we were there for like three hours, just taking everything in. And I, I still am kind of processing it. I've been going back through my pictures and I'm like, man, that place was, that place was a fucking like sanctuary for us. Right. When we walked in, we saw all these different beautiful TV screens showing different movies, you know, from, from In the Heat of the Night to Taxi Driver to, you know, Itu Mama Tembien to fucking Raiders of the Lost Ark to Raging Bull, all these different movies just, and we were like, we're home, man. Like, <laughs> this is, this is definitely where we're supposed to be. And as we, you know, I think it's four floors, <clears throat> uh, the, the museum altogether, we just slowly made our way up to the top. And in the middle of that, we were able to do something called the Oscars experience, which was uh, so cool. Uh, worth the extra money. If you ever go to the museum, definitely try to get that add on of doing the Oscars experience because it's just real, it's real quick, real easy. You just walk in. There's, there's a, there was a woman there who was kind of guiding us through everything. And basically what we got to do was go up on a little stage by ourselves with all these beautiful lights, all these beautiful cameras. And you got to hold a real nine pound Oscar and just get, get, get a little video taken of yourself. And then they email it to you. So both of us have a video of us with our masks on <laughs> fucking holding up that statue that, that is a lot heavier than it looks. And you're, you're just holding it up, looking at the camera, you know, doing what you do whenever you want to do. I fucking pointed at the camera. I was like, that's yes. Like, <laughs> and, and then, and then it's over, you know, and you get to have this video forever. Right. And that was so amazing. And around all of that was the, the Miyazaki uh, exhibit was incredible. It, it was it was the only sector of the museum where you couldn't take pictures. It was like a it was like a fucking dojo. It was so cool, and there were people that you could tell were mega fans that were inside there, just soaking everything in. Uh, there was the the room of the Oscars, where there's been Oscars that have been donated to the museum, from Clark Gable's for It Happened One Night to Sidney Poitier for Lilies of the Field to. Barry Jenkins for fucking Moonlight, his screenplay Oscar. That was so special and so cool to see these real statues uh, for, from history. Some people will think that's lame, but you and I were like, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God, this is so cool. The individuals that were represented in that room was really unique. It was a, it was reverent. Like I was, I felt like I was in the, in the company of like some of the most iconic and special artists in mm. film history and i i mean they had one of the original first oscars there they had a it was an oscar for sunrise 1927 yeah and i was like this is like almost 100 years old uh i i it was it was a surreal moment where i was like this is you can kind of chart the evolution of film through these oscars it went from 1927 to, I think, like 2016. Yeah. Barry Jenkins was the last, it was always the first one. It went all the way to Barry yeah. Jenkins screenplay Oscar. Really I think it cool. had like one from every decade. Yeah. And that was just unbelievable. I mean, oh, that, that was my favorite area of the museum. Um, 
but I loved getting to see, you know, they had little rooms dedicated to certain films and certain artists. There was a little uh, Citizen Kane section where we got to see the oh. actual Rosebud sled prop. I mean, God. Uh, they had a Bruce Lee room where you could see um, one of his costumes from Enter the Dragon, as well as like a, a wall of uh, all the posters of his brief but memorable film run from the big boss to game of death. Uh, God, it was just unbelievable. Uh, the spike Lee room. Oh, dude. <laughs> yeah. I've watched that video about 30 times since I, since we left, <laughs> it was a room of course, dedicated to the work and influence of spike Lee who won his first Oscar in 2018 for black Klansman best um, adapted screenplay. And that Oscar was there as well as his um, honorary award he received. They had, you know, the, the Do the Right Thing soundtrack, uh, Mookie's costume, uh, various posters of his work, but most, I think, significantly, posters that were given to Spike Lee by people who respected him and respected his uh, appreciation of film. And they had signed these posters of their own work. They, you know, Spielberg had one. Um, Akira Kurosawa, Kirk Douglas, Michael Jordan, uh, Barack Obama, yeah, um, Martin Scorsese, yeah. Scorsese. It was it was an endless plethora of artists, politicians, athletes. Just people, so many people have either taken something or have had something taken from Spike Lee. And I just I never really appreciated just how significant his his um contributions to film history are. And it's so cool that the Academy gave him his own fucking like wing. It was it was remarkable. Yeah, yeah. No, that that was when that was one of the first things we saw was that room, that beautiful room. And Terrence Blanchard, you know, his music is playing in the background. And you're like, oh my god, this is crazy. And and that's when I kind of realized, oh, this isn't a stroke fest. This is an ode to film, to film, to filmmaking, to filmmakers, to actors, to writers, to to cinematographers, there was that beautiful shot of Emmanuel Lubezki uh, working on The Revenant, and it was such a gorgeous shot. And it had it had still still photographs that he took of different people from The Revenant, and they were so gorgeous. And there was some of my favorite stuff. There was two rooms that we walked into that were that were playing videos, and one of them was about sound, and it pl- it was so cool. I'm getting chills talking about it right now. It was showing uh, uh, a scene from Raiders. And it was showing the progression of how sound works and gets put into the film. And it was showing that there's specific people who do certain things to give you that extra, whatever it is, you know, when the, when the ball is rolling, the boulder is rolling and, and, and going after, uh, in, uh, going after Harrison Ford, going after Indy, they, they would, they would uh, take her microphone and go outside in a vehicle, a car and put the microphone close up to the tire as it was going over gravel to give you that kind of that sound. And there was a woman who was, who was doing running sounds and stomping her feet to kind of capture that. Cause, cause when you're filming something, you know, you're not going to capture all of that perfectly. So you want to enhance that sound to give, give it that, that experience. And it was like five different stages that, that, the, that, that video took us through. And we were both like, Oh my God, that was so cool. <laughs> and then there was a, a really, really cool cinematography room where um, there were different people talking about talking about how important it is to capture different things with the camera for their movie, different perspectives, you know, whether it be camera A, camera B, camera C, or no, I have this one vision that there's going to be one camera here. And the coolest part was uh, Amores Peros was uh, like a featured film in that. And there's a huge scene in that movie where there's a car crash. And that's kind of the meeting point. It's a triptych film. It's, it's uh, three parts, three different stories. But the one thing that, you know, ties them all together is this car crash. I just watched that movie like two months ago. And I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. Like, cause I wondered, I wondered how they did that. And it, it answered it for me at this museum. There was a Pedro Omovadar wing. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, I couldn't believe my eyes. Every room we went into, I was like, oh my God. Like, this is built for cinephiles. This is built for, for movie pe- people, which is why I really hope 
people make the trip to that museum because it, again, it is not just about the Oscars. While there's a lot of Oscar stuff in there and the Oscar experience where you can take the statue, it's just an, it, it's just an ode to filmmaking. And it's just like, look how cool this medium is and how important this art form is. The costume room, it had the Midsommar costume. It had uh, Lupita Nyong'o's costume from Us. It had, again, the Big Lebowski. It had these different sculptures. I was just like, this is fucking incredible. And it was personally my favorite part of the trip just because I was so blown away by how much was there. I thought it was going to be one thing and it was another thing completely. And, and, and I, I will go back, you know, I, I will go back to that, to that museum one day. It was so, so special. And, and, you know, I, I think you and I, there, there were quite a few people there, but I think you and I were in a different realm <laughs> than, than, than most people there. You know, uh, we just, we were just eating it up, you know, and it was hard to leave. It was like, oh my God, is there more? Can we go up another floor? You know, <laughs> there was a, the Barbara Streisand bridge <laughs> leading out to these wonderful, uh, this wonderful, like giant fucking patio or looked Hollywood. And so we got to take some pictures of, of that. It was so cool. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I haven't stopped thinking about it. Uh, just the things I got to see the appreciation for film in LA is oh. unlike anything I've ever seen. I mean, I've always loved film, but, down here, you know, it's not, you know, movie theaters are movie theaters and film is consumed, not really appreciated down here. But over in L.A., film is a way of life. Yes. And it's, it's really cool. It's something I could definitely get on board with. <laughs> it's, it's how I've always viewed film. And, yeah. you know, just overhearing random people's conversations, nine times out of ten, it was about movies. Yeah. I felt like I was among my people. <laughs> for sure, for sure. And that's always been something in, 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 my, in my life. You know, I, I got to go to LA when I was 12 and that was, that was essential for my, for my growth as a movie fan, just, uh, just, just being there and being like, wow, you know, it really is a huge fucking deal here. This is where, you know, this is, this is Hollywood. This is where a lot of my favorite movies were born and that's where they flourished and that's where they live the longest. Um, living there would be very difficult just because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a fucking, you know, tough town, right? It's a tough place and it's very expensive. You know, California is very expensive, but I've always had, had a, had a little pipe dream of moving out there and being kind of a part of all that daily because it, it is, it's invigorating. It's, and, and we're about to get to more stuff that, that really gave us this juice of like, whoa, 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 whoa. These are our people. <laughs> and, you know, there, there's some of us all over the place, right? You know, there's people all over, all over the world that are so appreciative. But there's no place like L.A. where it's, it, it's, like you said, it's nine times out of ten. These people know what they're talking about <laughs> and really appreciate it. So, you, you know, as a cinephile, as you know, you and I are both fellow cinephiles. We, we, we felt at home in that sense where it was like, this is, this feels right. Uh, after the museum, we just kind of were like, wow. Okay. Uh, how are we going to top that? <laughs> how, how is, how is LA going to, how is LA going to top that? And it tried, LA definitely tried to, to, to blow our minds even more. Uh, we started walking towards uh, the, it's a lot of different names for it. I think most most notably, it's it's the the Fox Theater. It's a very famous theater uh, in Los Angeles. It's on uh, Broxton Avenue. Uh, if you look it up online, it's going to say Regency Village Theater and in Westwood Village, uh, known as also the Fox Village Theater. So it's got all these different names, but the Fox is kind of its its slang term, right? And it's a giant giant screen with so many seats and it's just that one screen in the theater right so before we before we got there though we stumbled into beverly hills <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, and we were like oh shit there's a there's a uh fucking bentley uh what do you call it uh dealership yeah Bent bentley dealership and we were both joking like i wonder how much money you have to have to walk in there and then uh we ended up going to this burger place that was really good called by the way burgers uh very good actually 
pretty decent prices. We enjoyed that a lot. It was raining pretty hard outside. So it was nice to go inside somewhere and just kind of enjoy some food. And then we took an Uber from there to the Fox and we uh, got our tickets. We walked in this usher who admittedly was kind of a dick was like, <laughs> was like, Hey, we got to clean the theater. You guys got to get out of here. So we we're like, okay. So we, there was a, there was a uh, BJ's restaurant right next to the theater. <clears throat> so we went there, had some drinks. Uh, then it was time to go back. And we saw Paul Thomas Anderson's new film, Licorice Pizza. And if you know me, <laughs> if you've heard me ever talk, this is my favorite director of all time. Pre- pre- pretty much hands down. I-, I adore everything he does. I love his attitude. I love his, uh, his storytelling ways are, are just, just beyond me. I-, I, don't, I don't really understand how he does it over and over. And now this was the fourth film I've seen of his in theaters, uh, The Master. Inherent Vice, Phantom Thread, and this one. So I was a little too young to see There Will Be Blood in theaters. I was only 12. So I had to start with The Master when I was, I was 17 when that came out. And uh, seeing Licorice Pizza in LA before the rest of the world is, is able to see it at the Fox with you was, was incredible. Like, it, 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 it's, it brought me to tears at one point, just thinking about it. When I got home, I was like, wow, I feel very, very fortunate to be able to do that. Um, there were multiple times while we were there. I was like, wow, I just, I, I, I feel really, really lucky and not much more being in the museum was amazing. And I loved that experience and I wouldn't trade that for the world, but seeing, and again, you know, me, Connor, uh, seeing Paul Thomas Anderson at work, in his, in that's his place. LA is his place. That's where he likes to, you know, San Fernando Valley and those surrounding areas. He loves to work in those areas and love, loves LA grew up there, you know, knows a lot about the, the uh, industry because of his dad. His dad was in advertising and did all kinds of stuff in LA for, for different movies and radio. And it was, it was just a surreal experience watching that movie. Um, it's a very, very weird movie. Uh, I'm still grappling with it. I, I really, really liked it. I laughed my ass off. You know, I thought it was very funny. I thought the cast was incredible. I think Alana Haim and Cooper Hoffman have just very bright futures when it comes to the to the big screen. But it is it is a it is a weird movie, and it it, it makes sense that something like this would only come out in LA and New York before the world. Right. It's, it's just one of those kind of films. It's not Spider-Man. <laughs> it's, it's not going to grab the attention of, of every person who's breathing in the United States. That's just not happening. But the, this, this is my, like in my mind, this is my Spider-Man. This is what I get up for the most is, 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 is guys like that. You know, the, the auteurs of our, of our world. And that was crazy. I, 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 I want to go back to that, to, to that museum, but I really want to go back to the Fox and see something else. You know, it was that kind of a theater where I think this is where you and I were, we were talking about Spider-Man uh, after we saw it on Friday, on Friday night, we were texting and it was like, dude, we got to see people clap for a Spider-Man movie here in Texas. And we got to see people clap and applaud in the middle of a Paul Thomas Anderson movie, which doesn't happen here. Just does not happen here. If you go see PTA's films in San Antonio or, or Austin, Austin, maybe a little bit more, but you know, Dallas or Houston or whatever it is, or anywhere really in the South, it, it's going to be like 10, 15 people. And they're all like, yeah, you know, we're here for this and it is what it is. But this was like his people. <laughs> it was like his disciples were there and it was packed. There was a lot of people there and it was so cool, man. I had so much fun seeing that movie there and I'm really glad you got to be there with me, you know, uh, cause I would have looked like a crazy person if <laughs> If I was there by myself. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Yeah, this was an honor. This was an, um, exciting. I, you know me, I've got my own feelings towards Paul Thomas Anderson for the most part. I do enjoy his films. Yeah. Um, I, this was my second Anderson in theaters. I saw Inherent Vice in 2015 with Caleb and we fucking hated it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, this was cool. And it was, you know, I have grown a lot since then. So I am able to kind of appreciate what Anderson was trying to pull off with this thing. It's a coming of age film. It's about, you know, we don't really remember every bit of our lives, but we remember the important highlights. And I think that's Mm. what he was going for is like, Mm -hmm. it's a clip show. Yes. 
So there you go. I figured it out. It took me a few days, but I figured it out. Yeah, that's that's exactly what he's going for, especially. I think when coming of age movies try to do stuff that is just not how young people act, right? It's young people. They just go off of instinct and they're like, I don't really care what the repercussions are. I'm just going to fucking do this and I'm going to do the next thing. And then I'm going to do the next thing. And Cooper Hoffman did such a good job. I mean, he, he is, he's like 17 or 18 and he's playing a 15 year old in the movie. That kind of a character study is, is so cool inside of licorice pizza because it's this guy who's just, on to the next thing, on to the next thing, on to the next thing. And it's, you know, it's about aspirations and friendships and getting into trouble, getting a little bit dirty, you know? And I, I love that about it. I love, like you said, it's just kind of just doing things, just doing, it's a, it's a clip show uh, that's on steroids and it, and it features Bradley Cooper's just finest supporting role of all time. <laughs> that guy, John Peters was real. He was yeah. Barbara Streisand's husband. Apparently he wasn't that crazy, <laughs> but he did let Paul Thomas Anderson which is, take some liberties. <laughs> which is great for us, yeah. <laughs> um, I also found out where the title came from. Uh, Licorice Pizza. I don't know if you looked that up. Of course. I listened to uh, Paul Thomas Anderson was on uh, Bill Simmons' podcast, and I listened to all of that. He explained a lot of surrounding the movie, and, and he explained a lot of Bradley Cooper his role and it was fascinating because <laughs> Bradley Cooper apparently read the script and was like, ah, I don't know, man. Uh, and then got to change some things. And he's the one, he's the one who said, uh, I, I, I want to say my old pickup line from when I was younger, which was, do you like peanut butter sandwiches? <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. What a charmer. Um, yeah. So seeing it, seeing that in the Fox, seeing that in a classic L.A. theater was really cool. And I love the way certain theaters in L.A. treat movies. They just have one screen, one movie like that movie mm. is all that matters to them for that week. Or however long. And yeah. we saw that throughout the city. We saw, you know, one trailer play, one theater playing American Underdog exclusively, one playing Spider-Man the next couple of days. It was it, it, it really is, you know a significant moment or a film release in LA is like a fucking birth. Like it's an announcement. It's significant. It's crazy. And I love the way they had a, uh, a pop-up pinball arcade for us after the Fat after the movie. Fat Bernie's. Yeah. We got to go to the fucking pinball palace yeah. after the movie. I've, I've never seen that before. That was the, such a neat idea. It kind of ruined Texas movie theaters for me. Like, after being treated like that, I'm like, I can't go back to just seeing a movie in the afternoon and being told to fuck off. I can't do that. <laughs> like, I need, I need the experience now. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, that was so unique, and, and it made me like the movie even more because, like you said, it was it treated it as if this is what's most important in your life right now. If you watch this movie, if you were here with us for this time and had this moment with everyone else. This is it. This is your day. <laughs> this is your Tuesday. And I, 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 I'm with you. You know, theaters across the board, all across the country, just they just they just can't do this. They don't do this. You, like you said, when you when you uh, normally, if you go to something like something like Draft House, is a great example. In, in in Texas, they do interesting things to try to get you riled up and get you excited. And you know, they serve food the entire time. But when it's over, it's over and they get you, they try to get your asses out of there so they can clean it and get the next people in like, bam, bam, bam. Like it's a fucking like it's clockwork. And they, it feels like, oh, you guys cared about me for two hours and then you just didn't care about me. This felt like, no, they care about the rest of our night. <laughs> they care about sending us off being joyful and excited and to go tell everyone about this movie. And that was that was so cool. It was like them telling the fucking gospel. It was, it was so special. And again, for it to be a Paul Thomas Anderson movie, I just, I couldn't believe the stars aligning. It's like, Oh, there is a God. I, <laughs> I can't, I can't believe I, I, I was here for this, you know? And, and, and I, I thought I was going to have to wait till, cause it's supposed to come out nationwide uh, Christmas day. I thought I was gonna have to wait till then to see it. But when I was like, okay, wait, we're going on this trip in December and it's out in theaters uh, Connor, please, we have to do this, you know? And you were like, yeah, let's fucking do it. You know, it's, it's two hours of our life. Let's do it. You know? And it ended up being this just joyful, wonderful experience. 
And then we walked around. I called my fiance and I was like, I can't believe what just happened. You called, you called your mom. I called my dad. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> you know, we were just, we just want to talk to the people that, that would appreciate what we just did. And then we just kind of found our way uh, into like West Hollywood. And we were in these, uh, we were amongst these just gorgeous homes. We were like, Oh, where are we? <laughs> and then that's when uh, we decided to get an Uber and go back to Amoeba because we were like, okay, we didn't really spend any money the first time we went to Amoeba. Let's go back. Let's spend some fucking money and buy some movies. And we did. We rushed. And, and our Uber driver actually uh, had a San Antonio connection. You know, her mom lives here, which is really cool. And she told us all about different things we should do. And she was really nice. That was great. And we got to Amoeba, like, literally with, like, 15 minutes left of, of, of them being open. And we went straight to the Criterion section, straight to the director section, and started looking through movies. What do we get? What do we get? What do we get? And, and, uh, I'm glad we had that deadline of, all right, we have this amount of time. You better make some decisions because otherwise you just get lost and you're like, oh my God, I could spend so much money here. I ended up getting on that trip. I ended up getting shortcuts and a mark for, uh, Altman and Fellini. So I was very happy with those pickups and, um, uh, very excited to have them on my shelf now. Uh, what did you get that time? That time, I ended up getting Roman Polanski's Cul-de-Sac, yes, and Stanley Kubrick's Doctor Strangelove. <laughs> Those were both my criterions. Criteria. Both criterions, yeah. Yes, same, same for me. We were like, we we came here. Let's go ahead and spend the fucking thirty-five dollars on some criterions. <laughs> uh, and then from there, we were like, fuck it, let's go back to Roscoe's. <laughs> <laughs> so we went to Roscoe's two days in a row because Roscoe's is very close to Amoeba. Uh, it's it's a pretty easy walk. Uh, again, right on the walk of fame. So we were having fun, just kind of looking around people watching, checking out different things. We walked past, uh, Hamilton was playing there and there's people all over the place outside getting ready to go see Hamilton. And, you know, you know, you got, you got your weirdos coming up, you know, uh, fucking strung out saying, welcome to Hollywood. You know, it was just one of those fun fucking, you know, little LA Hollywood experiences walking around. We went eight again. Uh, is there, is there something I'm missing? I feel like I'm missing something. Well, real quick, I do want to say on Roscoe's. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, you could talk about Roscoe's for an hour. Yeah. I fuck up fried chicken frequently like it owes me money. And Roscoe's is by far the, the best fried chicken I've ever had in my life. Like that is the nationwide place to go for fried chicken. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah I, 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 I totally agree. Uh, it is just like these other things we're talking about. Uh, we didn't, we didn't venture out a ton when it comes to food because we were, that's where we were trying to kind of save money to do other things, to buy movies and stuff. But Roscoe's is well-priced, great service, great atmosphere, awesome fucking music playing. And I loved that, uh, as you're walking out and you're paying your bill, there's a sign there that says proudly black owned business and eat that that shit's that shit's cool that shit is really cool and there is an there was an air in there of respect for what they're doing how original they are how good the food is and and legitimately trying to like to make this a, a community thing to make food a community thing to make food this important like a ritual where you have to eat to live and i, I loved how like simple and just, just fucking amazing the food was, right? Uh, it, yeah, that was that was an absolute blast. There's a reason we went twice, like two days in a row. There's, it was it was by far and away the best food that we had while we were there. Um, great stuff. And we were really full, and we walked back, back to our hotel. Uh, we stopped again to get some water and shit, and just kind of try to recharge because we had another full day ahead of us <laughs> uh, on on Wednesday. So. Our Tuesday night ended by us going back to the hotel, watching The Rock. <laughs> and we started playing a, a game that we are now going to play a lot when we're together called the IMDb game. Uh, this is a game where, you know, say you take Anthony Hopkins, you look at Anthony Hopkins IMDb on the app. And there's always, before you go in chronological order of the movies they've, they've been in, there's those top four right at the front, right when you click on their, their, their page. And we were both trying to give each other actors and guess what those four movies would be. We went back and forth for a long time, had a lot of fun that night just doing that. 
And then finally, you know, decided to decided to go to sleep because again, we had another long day. That was so much fun. Yeah, that was cool. I, I enjoyed that. Uh, really showed just how fucking huge dorks we are when it comes to film. We were yeah. able to just rattle off like deep cuts, hoping they would stick. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, I, I enjoyed that game. Yeah, lots of fun. It's also cool to see, uh, or maybe not cool, but funny to see, like, like for instance, Ben Stiller. Ben Stiller's are Zoolander, Zoolander 2, Tropic Thunder, and Walter Mitty. And we were like, what the fuck? <laughs> Where the hell is Meet the Parents? Where is Dodgeball? You know, <laughs> yeah. we, were, we were having fun with it that way as well. Uh, for Anthony Hopkins, one of the films you and I hadn't even really heard of. We were like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> out of all these wonderful roles that he's had uh that was there uh and it, it was it was really cool to just just have that moment like you said be dorks and sit sit in the hotel and just just fuck around it was cool yeah the world's fastest indian who knew yeah Fucking hopkins yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah it's like sounds the lambs uh that movie uh hannibal <laughs> so what the hell <laughs> oh man so that was um that was Tuesday. Wednesday, we had the uh, the big old tourist day where we got a, uh, a bus tour of uh, Los Angeles. Yes. Uh, with a crew of about 10 people and a driver. And that was that was fun. <laughs> um, yeah, we befriended this um, this quirky Australian guy who was just on like a three month trek across the country. And it was just a goofy, fun, cool guy who was just happy to be there. Yeah, yeah, he was great. I've been talking about him just as much as anything uh, that we did with like with with my family and friends. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Jeffrey was his name. He was a great guy. He he was talking about. He found out we were from Texas, and he was like, "Can I come to Texas and like find a gun range and just shoot guns?" And we were like, "Yeah." <laughs> <laughs> and he's he's like so like i can you know you know and he like held up held up like his hand like he was drinking he was like so i can have like a few cans and go out and shoot some guns and we were like yeah <laughs> please you know yeah texas is definitely the place for you sir uh yeah he he was he was hilarious it was his first time ever to the united states and you know you could tell he was excited and he sat next to us the entire time and, and he was he was great at first i was like oh god this guy might be kind of annoying and then he was just cool. He was just cool. And then when we got off on each stop, we would all kind of go our own way. We come back to the, to the bus and he'd be right there and he'd be like, Oh, like, what's up guys? What'd y'all do? You know? And he was just, he was fascinated. He, Cause we, on this tour, we got more movies uh, <laughs> and he was like, Oh, y'all just can't get enough movies. Can you? And we were like, no, we can't. No, we ne never will. Uh, the first stop was the Santa Monica pier. And that's where we went to the, uh, the famous hot dog stick and got basically corn dogs. Yeah, <laughs> and they, I mean, they were delicious. They were delicious. They were good. I mean, it's I don't know if world renowned is the right word. It's 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 country renowned, and yeah. um, <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a good corn dog. I don't know if it was worth six bucks, but it was a good corn dog. <laughs> yeah, no, no corn dog is worth six fifty, but uh, and no lemonade is worth five fifty. But uh, it was refreshing. It was refreshing. It was good good to eat because we hadn't eaten that day yet. Uh, and then from there. We took a nice, nice, nice long drive, went, got on the freeway, uh, and the wind was fucking blowing all over the place. We were listening to like 80s rock. It was great. Our, our uh, tour guide, his name was Randy. He was wonderful. Loved that guy. He was, he was great. Very, very kind guy. Knew a lot of interesting things about, about Hollywood and about uh, different areas that he clearly was attracted to himself. You know, he, he said he was born and raised in L.A., and you could just tell he just had this passion for the place. That was really cool. We went to the farmer's market, which uh, immediately we were like, holy shit, we have to piss. So we found a Barnes and Noble and we went inside the Barnes and Noble. And lo and behold, there was a <laughs> giant section of Criterion movies. <laughs> and we both were like, ah, shit. <laughs> Wish we would have gone somewhere else to piss. Cause, uh, cause you just, I, I can't help myself. I can't help myself when I see Criterions and they're all nicely in a row and they're all beautiful and gorgeous. And, and I, I have to, I have to buy some. So there is, that's where I bought thief, uh, Michael Mann's masterpiece, his best movie, hands down. And, uh, uh, boat, uh, boat travail, 
uh, Claire Denis film from 1999, one of my favorite 1999 films. Uh, great two pickups that I got from there. I settled on Terry Gilliam's Time Bandits, uh, one of my favorite little fantasy epics. And uh, yeah, we were just, we spent most of our time at the farmer's market cycling through the Criterion movies. And we ended up with about like 10 minutes to eat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. With that 10 minutes, we took like a roundabout way. The farmer's market's interesting. Uh, it's, it, it was fine. It was, it was cool. And it, I wish I could have walked around a little bit more, but it was like an outlet mall. It was like a giant outdoor mall type thing. And then it had this really cool section of food places. And you and I, of course, went to Danny Trejo's tacos. Oh yeah. And they were excellent. They were excellent. Those were about the same price as the fucking glorified corn dogs. And I would much rather have the tacos than the, 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 the hot dog stick. The, those tacos were very good. Like you said, we had to fucking scarf those down, get back to the, the tour bus, and we got going again. And that's when we had the privilege of being with Randy, our tour guide, who was like, look, most of these tours, they go to the Griffith, uh, Griffith Observatory, which is closed right now, uh, has been closed for a little while due to COVID. And he's like, that's where most people go because you get kind of a, like a balcony type view of the Hollywood sign and you can take pictures and whatnot. Uh, but it's pretty far. It's a pretty far picture if you're trying to get that Hollywood sign. So he was like, I'm going to take you guys to the reservoir. And it's a way closer, way better shot. It's got all this beautiful nature around it. There's like a little lake right there. And he took us way up into the Hollywood Hills where all these celebrities houses are, uh, all these YouTube ho- uh, YouTubers houses are. It's just this crazy place where we were going up this, these fucking hills, They're these tight little roads that we definitely weren't supposed to be on. Fucking little bushes and trees were slapping us across, you know? It was so cool. And it felt like we were in good hands, right? You know, it was like, oh, this guy really cares about our experience. And we've got that great shot of the Hollywood sign. You and I got to take a picture together in front of it. And we got to just kind of, just kind of soak in the nature for a second, which was cool because we were, we we're so much around people the entire trip. It was cool to just be in nature looking at this, this, at this point, this fucking like monument that people go there to see. And uh, that was very cool. You know, as touristy as it is, it was very cool to see the sign up close. Uh, I definitely recommend people try to go there instead of the Griffith Observatory, like Randy said. Very cool. And then from there, he kept going through the hills and took us on that. Uh, celebrity homes tour to kind of finish off our uh our trip with him and that was that was neat right i'm not one to be like oh my god i have to take a picture of every single house that we cross but it is cool to see jack nicholson's house to see leonardo dicaprio's house and denzel washington's house pretty cool it was just cool to be on maholan drive oh uh, well, yeah yeah that, <laughs> that was neat the reservoir you know kept making me think of chinatown yep that was exciting um and it was yeah it was neat to see the YouTuber's house pissed me off. Cause like yeah. all this dude's doing is playing video games and acting like a child. And he's worth like $10 million. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. think like, yeah. I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. It was, it was, uh, the, 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 like the house that's highest on that hill is owned by phase clan. These, this team of gamers and I've seen them play. I, I don't care for them. I don't I think I think they're all like brutally annoying and very self-absorbed type people. So uh, they probably do, you know, cool charity work or whatever. And that's great. I'm sure they I've seen videos of gamers who are like, look, we give our money to homeless people. Neat. That's cool. You guys are still annoying. You know, you guys y'all's content. Y'all's content's annoying. So it was a, it, it was a bit like, all right, I don't care about these guys. I care about Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> I also don't trust anyone who makes a video of them being generous. Like, you know, look at how generous I am. Aren't I such a saint? It's self-serving bullshit. Just, just do it. You don't have to film it. Just do it. Do the yeah. right thing for the right reasons. That's why I like, like Lady Gaga just does that shit. She doesn't broadcast yeah. it. Keanu Reeves just does that shit. Like they're good people. I, these, I don't trust anyone who, you know, fellates themselves like that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, but that, that was cool though. Right. And, and again, we saw different Mulholland Drive signs like 15 different times. And we were like, this is great. <laughs> great movie. Uh, <laughs> one of my favorites of all time. Uh, I'm, I'm shocked it didn't. At, at any point during our tour, I was like, are we going to mention that that's the name of David Lynch's masterpiece from 20 years ago? 
And I guess Randy hasn't seen it. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but from there, uh, and you and I were interacting. We were at the very back of the bus, but we were interacting with Randy the whole time, shouting out stuff, you know, trying to, trying to have some fun. I remember the, um, we passed by a, a, a house that featured in the pilot episode of Lucifer. And he was mm. like, are there any Lucifer fans here? And only me, only I was like, woo. Yeah. And, <laughs> and he was like, well, you might be interested to know this. And I'm like, oh, that's neat. Yeah. <laughs> so it was cool getting to just kind of, yeah, be a tourist and be dorky and be just, you know, embrace that. It was fun. Yeah, it was. It was. And again, all with uh, Jeffrey, the Australian, right, right next to us, just making us crack up. Uh, all the stuff that we could actually understand that he was saying. <laughs> uh, and then, so from there, uh, he took us on a long ride. We, we kept going through different parts of Hollywood. And then uh, uh, we ended up back at the Walk of Fame at this big, big like uh, gift shop store called La La Land that just has all these different trinkets and T-shirts and whatnot that you can buy that say Hollywood on them or, or whatever. They had the little Oscars for sale that say, best dad or best boss or whatever it is. And that was fun, right? That was fun to just go one of those giant shops that has all those little things you could buy. Uh, and, and then you and I were like, uh, Amoeba. <laughs> we had a couple hours to kill until yeah. our, um, our double feature at the new Beverly, which we'll talk about in a minute. So we were like, fuck it. Let's go back to our favorite store. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's where, that's where we did some more shopping. Uh, I was able to get a record for Bri- uh, my fiance, Brianna. I got one more movie. I got Vivre Seve by Jean-Luc Godard, my favorite movie of his that I've seen. Uh, another criterion to add to the collection. Uh, and then, and then we, then we went to uh, Buffalo Wild Wings. Yeah. We, uh, we, we wanted something familiar. We wanted to just kind of veg out, sit down for a minute after our tour before the movie. Uh, and, and so we chose that place. It was very good. It was, it was very good. Uh, giant, the biggest Buffalo Wild Wings I've been inside of. I um I do want to point out my first the first time we went to Amoeba I did buy an Ice Cube single that had yes. the uh, the Lynch Mob Records logo on it and I was like fuck yeah it was like three bucks and the yeah. soundtrack to Roman Polanski's Test it was a Polanski heavy uh week for me weirdly and um, <laughs> then uh, at our third go I bought um, Frank Capra's You Can't Take It With You Best Picture winner 1938 which I I really enjoyed it was like ten bucks beautiful yeah I'll take it. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's the thing is that this, at this Amoeba store, you know, there is, there is these Blu-rays for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten dollars all over the place. And then that criterion section, just, I couldn't, I couldn't get away from it. It's like, God damn it. I'm spending too much money, but I, but I walked away with five criterions and I'm very, very happy with them. And I'm really glad I got them. They're, they're very, very cool. And I always cherish, you know, getting those. Uh, after that is when we, made our way we got we got the most fun uber driver of all time uh a guy from bangladesh who was just he was making us crack up we were making him crack up it was great it was a great great ride uh and then he he took us to the new beverly cinema uh quentin tarantino's theater which is so cool because that was our last stop of the trip and it was pretty much why we made the trip out there in the first place right like three years ago we decided we wanted to go there because of that so that was that was unreal. And the place was packed, absolutely packed. You know, it was like sold out at this little theater that has one screen. Again, it's like, this is it. This is what you're seeing. And it was a double bill of National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation from 1989 and Scrooged from 1988. Come on. <laughs> and the place was fucking rowdy and was, everybody was laughing their asses off. We were both really tired from the day, but like, 10 minutes into, into a Christmas vacation, we looked at each other and we were like, I'm up. <laughs> I, I, I'm up. I'm up for this. We're seeing both these movies. We're going to, we're going to sit here. We're going to get refills of fucking Coke. We're going to get popcorn candy, you know, and just have some fun. And fun is, is an understatement. This was, this was unreal. Everything. Uh, one of the, one of their things is on, on the, on, on their main sign, it says always on film, you know, and every single film they show is on film. None of it's digital. Uh, they had an MC who kind of introduced the two movies that they're going to be playing and said, look, everything we do is on film because it looks better. It's more authentic experience. It's not that digital shit. He's like, so if you look for that, go somewhere else. You know, it was really cool to kind of, it was like a cult. <laughs> it's like, this, this is what we're doing. And in between the movies, 
a, one of the projectionists came down and was talking to some people like a couple rows in front of us. And he was talking about how during Christmas vacation, there were like a couple blips uh, during Christmas vacation. And he was like, yeah, we got a new guy working up there, but you know, he's a cool guy and he's doing his best. And uh, you know, that's why there were a couple of those blackouts. <laughs> and it was, that was so unique. That was so, so raw and so authentic. It's a true art form to be able to be a projectionist, to really work with film. And it's something now I'm like, I'm so excited to learn about and I want to learn how to do it. I don't know how I'm going to, but I'm looking into, you know, buying fucking 35 millimeter film and trying to like buy movies and actually, you know, learn how that works and how that, how that operates because it's so much more unique than putting a fucking DVD or Blu-ray or whatever it is into a fucking player and pressing play and then fucking sitting there, you know, uh, it's, it's an experience watching the graininess of film to watch how it was properly, how it was properly made. Right. Was this is how it was meant to be years and years ago. And there's something really special about that. And we felt, I think we felt more at home in that theater than anywhere else inside of LA. Yeah, I think you're right. I, you know, nobody say what you want about Quentin Tarantino, you know, you know, yeah, he comes across as a douchebag. Yeah. He's, you know, he thinks he's a genius. I think I think he's right, but I think nobody appreciates film more than he does. He and I I realize that with this theater because you know it wasn't you know gourmet pretzels and shit. It was like you know Coke, popcorn, hot dogs, and it was like two like two to four bucks was the range of pretty much everything there. And you don't see that anymore. Like he didn't give a shit about the concessions. He just wanted you to be able to afford it so you can enjoy yourself. Like that's that was the whole point of this place was people who are going to go there are the people who love film as much as he does and want to have that experience and want to be able to say that, you know, I got to see whatever movie on 35 millimeter. Like that's, that's special. That's not a lot of people can say that, especially down here. Like we, we got to see two Christmas classics on 35 millimeter at Quentin Tarantino's theater in a sea of film buffs who, what a, what a fucking story. What a, what a night. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Just excellent stuff. And God, and, and then, you know, just to give more context, the stuff that's playing there is so unique and is all selected by him. You know, we had, we had just missed uh, uh, a few days prior to when we got there, they had a showing of the shining there, you know, and they're they're the, at the end of the month, they're getting, they're doing licorice pizza for like four days in a row. Like that's what they're doing because, you know, uh, Quentin and, uh, Paul go like way back, you know, they've known each other since like the late nineties and they, it's really cool how they've kind of, it's almost like they're in like a rivalry, but it's like a friendly competition where Tarantino's like, here's my ode to Hollywood, you know, uh, once upon a time in Hollywood, uh, based in the late sixties and Paul Thomas Anderson's like, here's my ode to Hollywood in 1973, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, in the surrounding areas in Sino and San Fernando Valley. And, uh, you know, they just, they both are like just complete masters of their game. And it was, it's so cool to see that they're kind of teaming up. And I read more about that. Uh, I actually, on my lunch today, I was reading about how Paul Thomas Anderson is, is, is big, 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 big on film. You know, he's, he's stated that in boogie nights, Jack Horner, Burt Reynolds character says, I'm always going to work on film because if we move to video, it looks like shit and it sounds like shit then it must be shit. <laughs> and he's always stated that very clearly within his characters in his movies, that film is by far and away the better way to do things. The more vintage, the more real, the more authentic, the better looking one, even if it's older, you know, it's just the way it was intended to be. And it's so cool that Quentin Tarantino's like, well, I can work with that because I know he's going to have it available in 70 millimeter and he's going to be able to give me he's going to be able to give me these film reels of his fucking movie that I can play in my theater for four days straight in late December. So fucking cool. Part of me was like, can I stay here until then <laughs> and just watch it again at new Beverly? Cause that would, that would have been, uh, I mean, that would have been ridiculous. Oh yeah. I adored the, like you could tell the, the kind of, camaraderie between him and uh anderson just by the like showing his preview and tarantino showing the hateful eight trailer like the previews were 
coming attractions to his theater, not just regular, you know, we saw like the old Gremlins trailer, the Die Hard trailer. Like that was neat. Yeah. Um, but there's definitely, you know, these guys who come up together who, you know, remember like who have a love of film and get to do something with it because of their stature in the community. It's fantastic. And like, I want that so bad. I want to be able yeah. to preserve film to celebrate film like this. I want that so bad. Yeah. Yeah. It was so unique. And what a way to cap off our trip, right. Is to do something that so LA, <laughs> so LA, no, nowhere else is that, is that really being done by someone like Quentin Tarantino at this tiny theater that has one screen, maybe what would you say? Like a hundred, 120 seats, maybe something like that. Maybe and they were small seats, really like packed together. There was only one floor. Um, yep. The the men's room was like a broom closet. That was ridiculous. Yeah, uh, that did kind of that did kind of suck. In between movies, it was like yikes. Yeah, but I kept going back to the concession stand because I was like, you know what, two dollar cokes. Yeah, fuck yeah, why not? And yeah, I ordered. I got a popcorn. I remember I got a small, and the guy was like, you know what, how about a medium? Merry Christmas. And I'm like, yeah, right on, man. Like, thank you. Yeah, yeah. The the employees there were wonderful. Like so welcoming and so about us having the best time that we possibly could. So yeah, just hats off to that place. If you ever get a chance, if you're listening and you ever get a chance to go to LA, I would say <clears throat> that that theater and the museum are absolute musts, absolute must. If you want to see a new, new film, new release at the Fox, that's great. There's a lot of other theaters in LA that are great. Uh, we got to walk past the famous arc light, the Cinerama dome. Yeah, it's shut down right now. Good God. I, I really hope it gets to open back up one day because that that's that's the place I that's the Mecca. That's where I really want to go at some point. But it, it, again, it's just the Mecca. It's the Mecca of uh, especially American filmmaking. It's the Mecca. And I'm so glad we got to go there together. It was so cool. Uh, and talking about it has just you know made me enjoy my time there even more. So we we left New Beverly. We got a got an Uber and we were both like, oh man. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming it's coming to a close god damn it we went back uh went back to the hotel watched watched some sin city played the imdb game a little bit more had some you know just kind of talked about how cool everything was and we got up fucking real early the next morning so we could fly from la to phoenix and then phoenix to austin it was a long ass day and uh definitely wanted to just stay there a little bit longer <laughs> and, and you know that that's just how it's always going to be when you leave somewhere you you fall in love with it's weird because most trips I t i'm a very home base kind of guy where I, yeah. I like to travel but after a few days i'm like all right this is fun but i want to go home this trip i didn't i didn't feel that i was like i, I can keep going i want to stay in this city more i want to explore more i want to hang out with you more like this is this is a good trip i am having fun and I, I didn't, I didn't want it to end. And that's, that's exceedingly rare for me. So I, yeah, I, I appreciate that trip big time, man. Yeah. Yeah. Again, being with you, you know, one of the best friends I've, I've had on this earth and by far and away the biggest movie fan that I know, you know, uh, someone who just eats all of it up like I do. Uh, it, it's very cool because we match each other's energy and, and what, what the best part was, uh, I don't want to throw any, throw any shade at my family, but family trips require, they require so much uh, like of this unnecessary energy of, you know, all these opinions flying around and this is what we should do. You and I were just kind of like, fuck it. Like we're just going to go do stuff. And by that nature just kind of took its course and we just had fun. Uh, we had these, we had these things that we had scheduled that we were going to get to, but in between we just kind of around and had fun. Uh, stumbled upon Roscoe, stumbled upon Amoeba, uh, you know, and just walked on the Walk of Fame endless times. You know, we walked a whole lot. Uh, I'm still tired from it, you know. <laughs> it, it, it was it was an absolute blast. Uh, and, you know, it was really cool to come back home. You know, we, we got back Thursday night. Uh, I I, uh, I live live next door to my, my brother uh, and his wife. And so I got to kind of tell them about what we got to do and show them the movies I bought and it's like, oh man, it was so cool, you know. Uh, and then the next day was able to go see Spider-Man on Friday night. So pretty good week. <laughs> yeah, pretty good. You know, with that, I also had some personal stuff happen that was just lights out, fantastic news. So this may be the this may be the greatest week of my life. 
Yeah, if you had, it wouldn't be cool if you got to be in like a white room. Uh, it was just you and the best weeks of your life, and you had them all lined up, and you're like, wait, <laughs> I think that might have been it. <laughs> <laughs> uh very cool very cool but uh yeah we could go on and on forever uh about about what we got to do and the experiences we had the the kind of movie you know we both obviously love this shit to death and you know we've been doing these podcasts now for a long time you know, we've been doing a film guysm for what seems like a decade you know and it's just so much so much fun for us we're gonna keep doing it you know us for sunday we're on our 81st episode here uh but I thought it was just really important to use some of our podcast time. And this is the one where you and I are always on it. I thought it'd be, be smart to just kind of reminisce and have fun and, and, and hopefully inspire people to go do some of the things we got to do and more, you know, go find your own shit, go find your own little niches of, of LA and, and Hollywood and, and have fun with it. You know, I, I, I think it's a, a place that you got to visit. If you're a cinephile, you just got, you got to try it out. And I know one day we're going to go back. Um, Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse <laughs> finally getting to the, uh, the, the film of, of the episode um, real quick where does this you don't have to say an exact number but is this like in your top five Spider-Man movies or like where is it it's towards the it's towards the top it's uh, yeah. it's not quite favorite but it's original it's beautifully animated it's really cool and it's fun um, and it's the first time we got to, re- you know, really shine a spotlight on Miles Morales, uh, mm. you know, the other Spider-Man who I'm like 90% sure is coming in the MCU in the next five, 10 years. hundred um, <laughs> percent. But yeah, it was neat to see a different sort of Spider-Man story. Not just, you know, Uncle Ben's dead, radioactive spider bite, great power comes great responsibility, you know, fight the Green Goblin, fight Doc Ock. This time. You know, it was different. It was different characters. It was a different kind of Spider-Man story. And I liked that. I appreciated that. And also, my uh, black cousin, whose name is Miles, fucking loves this movie. <laughs> I, as he should. <laughs> as he should. <laughs> like he, yeah, he went absolutely ballistic when he saw this, and he's never let it go. He's about the same age as Miles Morales would be here. So he's just... <laughs> I love that kid. Anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, that, movie. that is that is the coolest kind of representation when it's like, it's like, that's me. (laughs) That, that quite frankly is me, you know? Uh, And, and, you know, like you and I have been able to watch fucking thousands of 20 something year old white guys just live in life. It's very rare that uh, in a superhero film, especially that a young black teenager is at the forefront. And that is one of the coolest things about it. Right. Is, is that representation the soundtrack is is so much different than what we're used to for a, a superhero movie very very cool i remember seeing this uh actually at draft house in 2018 uh the draft house uh san antonio uh, stone oak and i was i was blown away i was my expectations were like sort of high but i walked out like whoa holy shit is that my favorite spider-man movie ever like that was crazy and and i'm with you it's somewhere at the top I'm obsessed with the first two Sam Raimi Spider-Man, Spider-Man one and two. I am now obsessed with No Way Home, and then and then and then it's this one. That's my top four in some kind of order. Those four are like fucking masterpieces to me. This movie rocks. I'm so glad it won Best Animated Feature. I think it's just well deserved within this within this category. Uh, it it went up against Incredibles two, eh. uh, Isle of Dogs, pretty good. Uh, Mirai. And Ralph breaks the internet. It's just better than all of those, you know. It's just, it's just, it's, it's a movie that we've never seen within that genre, within the animated genre. The, it, the way it looks, how alive it is, it's fucking electric. And no other animated movie kind of goes toe to toe with it, and that's really cool. Yeah, definitely. And I, I really didn't care for Incredibles too, and I was worried it was going to be just another automatic Pixar win. But this thing kind of came out of nowhere i had very low expectations because at the time sony's track record you know they had the garfield movies which were kind of a disaster they had venom which worked somehow i still can't quite figure out how that movie grossed that much money and was actually pretty watchable but outside of mcu spider-man sony's handling of that character has hadn't been great 
and this felt like something that they like wanted to make to like bring in the kids or something. It felt like a cash grab until I saw the movie. And then I was like, okay, this is something special. And I think that, you know, that was good going in with, I think, kind of a hesitation. Cause it, I don't know, just made the experience a little bit more powerful for me anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah I, f- I feel that. And it is a really fun, exciting movie with an incredible voice cast. Uh, mm-hmm. Where else are you going to get to see Spider-Man Noir and Spider-Ham have dialogue together? Played by fucking Nick Cage and John Mulaney. <laughs> I mean, yeah, holy shit. That was, that was something else. Yeah. I mean, ev- everyone is great. My, uh, what we're definitely going to get to the, you know, the PSH award will be for our favorite vocal performance. But my, my mind was blown when I saw this because I didn't quite know who everyone was. But as you're, you know, when you watch animated movies, you're like, holy shit, that's fucking, you know, that's this guy, that's this lady. And, and I was like, wait, Catherine Hahn is Doc Ock? Are you kidding me? <laughs> that's fucking insane. And Brian Tyree Henry is, his, is the dad and Mahershala Ali is his brother. What is happening? <laughs> like, I couldn't believe, couldn't believe my, my ears when I first saw this. I was like, wow, all these people that are involved. No wonder it's, it's just hitting on all cylinders. I, I think what I, I love about this is, is something that you, I mean, there's a lot of things I love about it. Again, the way it looks, how electric it is, how funny it is, how endearing it is. The, the, the expectations of it being maybe a cash grab or maybe being a, a kid's movie, uh, it, it does that. Like, like my daughter, who's is two going to be three in a couple months, she loves this movie. She loves watching it. She thinks it's incredible. She, she even reacts to um, Brianna, my, my fiance, again, she was telling me uh, they watched it while we were in LA together, just them two. And Willow was reacting emotionally, like how she should to this movie. Like, wow. when, uh, like when Uncle Aaron dies, like she was sad. And that's so fucking powerful to be able to connect like all these generations of people to feel those things. And that's something that I feel like Spider-Man does has done so well in, in, in different movies. And of course, with no way home, good God, you know, and in this movie, just like it, you know, it just, it just pulls on your heartstrings like hard that scene. Uh, when uh, I, uh, Miles father goes to his room and he's got his mouth webbed up. And he's talking to him like I, I'm. I'm getting teary-eyed thinking about it. That scene is fucking like heart shattering. And I love when mo- I love when movies do that. It's one of my favorite things movies can do is is connect with you on that kind of a level. And like like you said, it was supposed to be maybe a or we thought it was going to be a kids movie. And it's like holy shit, this is this is ruining me. And it's redefining what an animated movie can be. It's redefining what you can do when you have the theatrics of of comic books and animation together i i think you know there's supposed to be one next year right you know in 2022 there's the next the next uh, installment of this of the animated spider-man franchise and i can't fucking wait you know that's gonna be one of my most anticipated movies of 2022 mm-hmm. along with a lot of other cool shit but i can't wait because going to that world being in that world is so unique it's it's on par with you know like what Studio Ghibli has done with their with their animation, and what what Wes Anderson has done with his animation. You know, it's like it's so unique and so its own that you can't help but kind of fall in love with that world building. Very cool. Yeah, right on, man. I I've never seen animation like this before. I, no, uh, it looks like a comic book, but also kind of looks like like uh, like graffiti, which I think is intentional because of you know. Uh, Miles' whole uh, tagging thing. Um, that's cool. But it's also, you know, apart from just the awesome design of the film, the emotional depth of the characters is crazy. I mean, even like the bad guy, Kingpin, who I never would have thought would be a, like the villain to go to for a multiversal Spider-Man movie, but like, fuck yeah, okay. And um, all he wants is his family back. Like, that's what this is all about. This whole movie is about family. And, you know, the consequences of lying to them, the, you know, we see that for, for multiple characters. And, uh, yeah, it's just one of those films that 
was not what I expected to be and has ended up being just a delight. Yeah. Yeah. So special. Yeah. I, it's one of the standouts for, for best animated feature from, from its history of being a category to me. I think that one in spirited way, just kind of stand in their own kind of category of these are like, like you said, Pixar wins a lot, (laughs) you know, Disney, Disney and Pixar, they do really well. These these movies kind of stand on their own and and their uniqueness and their their place in animated film history of being totally themselves, being kind of unapologetically themselves. This movie is very silly at times, very serious at times, and just plain cool, plain cool. And the 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 design and soundtrack have a lot to do with that, as well as the representation that's within it. You know, uh, very very cool. Kingpin, holy shit! I love I love that because. Uh, you know, uh, you know, there's there's some rumblings about Kingpin real and, and you know live action, but there's a the an, the animation Kingpin is this massive fucking like truck looking guy, and I love that about it. I think that's really cool. Oh, it's so neat. And Liev Schreiber was a great choice to just be this New York gangster. Uh, but you know, we also get to see the Prowler, and Doc Ock, and a brief moment with the with the green goblin uh it's all yeah it's cool i love my favorite thing about this movie is the uh the constant origin stories and how every time they're like all right let's get this over with every time and we get to see how each of these guys became spider-man in their own universe uh yeah i think this is a really creative movie i really i really like this yeah yeah it's awesome do you think do you think because you know you know uh animated films can get into other categories every now and again. Do you think it deserved to be in anything else? Um, maybe, uh, sound, like sound design, sound editing, uh, maybe visual effects, considering how unique the animation style is. Uh, that'd probably be it for me. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is hard because, this is this is a this is the ninety uh, first Academy Awards is when Green Book won Best Picture, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody won the most awards with four at this ceremony. Uh, the most nominations uh, went to The Favorite and Roma with ten each. Uh, I love both those movies, but I would personally, if we were playing this game, I would replace either Green Book or Bohemian Rhapsody with Spider Man to the Spider Verse for Best Picture. I think it's that good. Wow. That's high praise. Very nice. And I know how much you hate Green Book. So yeah, I hate Bohem- I hate Bohemian Rhapsody more for sure. So if I had to take one out, it would be that one. I gave both of those films nines. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I'm a I'm a sucker for certain things. I don't know what it is. Uh Bo- Bohemian Rhapsody for sure. I just don't, there's a lot of things I don't just straight up don't like about it, including the fact that I don't like when people don't sing. That's like a huge, huge stipulation I have with, with movies. When I learned that the guy or the, or the woman, whoever it is, didn't sing like Natalie Wood didn't sing in West side story, 1961. I'm like, well, fuck that performance. Uh, Rami Malek doesn't sing. And we saw a guy he went against that year, Bradley Cooper sang and like learned how to sing and played, played Jackson, uh, Jackson Maine in a star is born. And, like kind of crushed it. So I, I hate when that happens, when someone gets praised, when they didn't do kind of like half the work, when it's a movie about like uh, your man in rocket man, he sang. Yeah. Why is he not up? Why is he not up uh, after, after Rami Malek wins the Oscar? It just doesn't make much sense to me. So I have my issues with that one. Green book. It's fine. It's fine. I think both performances uh, by Vigo and Mahershala Ali are, are pretty good. Uh, I think Vigo is, is, is like wild in it. And, and it's, it's a, it's one that'll make you smile and laugh and uh, pr- probably cry a couple of times, but overall, I just don't think it's like a great film. Uh, I'm not too keen on the way Peter Farrelly like accepted everything that year and was like, yeah, we can fix racism. It was just, it, it left a bad taste in my mouth. So I, I, I also just think there's other movies that are better. I think vice is definitely better. I think A Star is Born is better. I think Roma is definitely better. 
the favorite Black Klansman, Black Panther, certainly. And I think uh, Spider-Man of the Spider-Verse is a better movie. And we've seen it before. You know, we've seen movies get into that group, you know, Beauty and the Beast and Up and Toy Story 3. It happens, right? It can happen. Uh, I also think uh, the year before, Coco should have been up for Best Picture as well. Yeah. I, think animated, I think animated movies are like wicked powerful. And when they're done correctly and have that, that, that there's like a certain tone to them, I think they can just, just floor an audience. And I think Spider-Verse did that. So I wish it would have got, gotten something else. Um, I love the screenplay too for Spider-Verse. It is fantastic. But this is, this is a tough group to get into, right? Uh, both, both original and, and adapted are, are, are tough groups to get into. Yeah, and since this is based on existing properties, it would end up in best adapted. Correct, and that would have meant that that means you would have to take out either a Star Is Born. That's tough. If Beale Street, if Beale Street could talk, no fucking chance. That's getting taken away. Uh, <laughs> Can you ever forgive me? Pretty damn good. The Ballad of Buster Scrubs, pretty damn good. And the winner, Black Klansman, fucking you know, fucking Spike. So uh, that's tough. That's tough to take one of those out. Yeah, is. It was a good year for the most part. I think a lot of the wrong awards went to, I mean, a lot of awards went to the wrong movies in some cases, but overall uh, there are some favorites from this, from this group. And it is cool that Spider-Man uh, became a, you know, one of the few Oscar winning superhero movies. Yes. And that, that is awesome. Right. That's so cool. I, it's not often enough that superhero movies get the proper shine that they deserve. Uh, over the past decade, for sure, with what Marvel has been putting out, uh, you know, there's yeah, there's been those spotlights, but they're you know, to me, Infinity War also came out this year and is better than a lot of these movies that are up at the top. So that's just that's just definitely how I feel. I think it was a strong year for for superhero movies in general. Black Panther, Infinity War, Sp- what the fuck? Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. And Infinity War ended up with just a visual effects nomination that it lost to fucking first man. I, I don't understand. Like, it's like they're afraid of something. I don't, I don't understand. No way home is certainly uh, going to be knocking on that door. Like, Hey, what do we have to do? <laughs> just for, you know, the way Doc Ock looked, I can say Doc Ock's in this. He's in the previews. So the way Doc yeah, Ock was that's, DH'd, that's not a, that's not a spoiler. Yeah. yeah he looked incredible. Like I didn't, I couldn't tell with the technology like that de-aging tech has finally caught up which is so good the you know the future implications of that are going to be staggering yeah alfred molina is 68 years old and they brought him literally back to 2004 it was crazy (laughs) oh yeah wonderful yeah great great stuff so you want to uh give some awards out to spider-verse have some fun why not Let's do it. Let's finish the show off properly. Uh, we have the Tarantino Award for best quote of the movie. We have the <laughs> Tarantino, New Beverly. Uh, we, we have the Ennio Morricone Award for best music moment. Uh, we have the Philip Seymour Hoffman Award for best performance. In this case, it'll be best vocal performance. And we have the Roger Deakins Award for the best scene of the movie. Speaking of, I want to go back to the museum because I know at some point they're going to have a Roger Deakins wing. And I need to, I need to see that. <laughs> oh my God. That'll be incredible. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. What's, what's your Tarantino, man? I have three. Um, two of them are funny. One of them serious. Uh, the first one comes from when uh, Peter B. Parker and Miles infiltrate uh, Doc Ock's lab in like the woods. And as they're leaving, uh, one of the scientists screams, he took a bagel. <laughs> and I, just, I love that, that. That was so funny. <laughs> I love that scene so much. Uh, the other one comes from when uh, Prowler and Scorpion and the uh, Tombstone attack Aunt May's house. And the uh, Spider-Men go up in battle. And Spider-Man Noir, voiced by Nicolas Cage, says... Like, you know, somebody says, like, it's really cramped in here. Shouldn't we do this outside? He says, like, we don't pick the ballroom. We just dance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Nicky Cage is amazing in this movie. <laughs> and then my final line actually comes from fucking Spider-Ham. 
Okay. Um, it's after the uh, the death of Uncle Aaron. And he tells Miles some very sage advice. He says, the hardest thing about this job is you can't always save everybody. And it's an important lesson every version of Spider-Man has to learn at some point is you can't save everybody. The important thing is that you try. Yeah. And that's that's one of the best things about the Spider-Man movies. Because always when we're introduced to him, he's, he's a kid. He's a teenager. He's a yeah. kid. Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield, Tom Holland. Miles Morales, you know, this, they're all, they're, they're kids and they're prone to making these sometimes irrational decisions, these emotional decisions that can, I mean, we saw it no way home, right? <laughs> we, we see, we see D miles at this kind of this crossroad of what exactly is this and what exactly am I signing up for by being spider-man of my universe and and that that was a great i almost chose that spider ham just breaks it down perfectly and we always have someone break it down you know in the spider-man movie someone's always like this is what it is buddy and in that case it was john mulaney very cool there's a fucking super powered pig that told miles the the straight talk about what it's like to be (laughs) spider-man fantastic i love it uh (laughs) my tarantino is a is one that i Remember in the theater, I, I just lost it, lost my mind. I was laughing so hard. And then when I, I kind of forgot about that line, and then I watched it again for this, for this episode. And I was like, oh, yeah, I remember my reaction in the theater <laughs> to this line because it's so genius. And it's such a, it's one of those, uh, I like to call them like, like bridge quotes in movies. When in a family movie or a, whatever, kids movie, there's something that is supposed to attract the, the adults in the room and the young adults, adults, whatever it is, parents, whatever it may be, where I'm taking my kid to see this, but I also want to have fun too. And I think this is one of the most perfect quotes in that category of all time. It's uh, at one point, just some guy in Brooklyn, a bystander, is uh, looking at a stoplight and the stoplight glitches. And then he goes, I think it's a Banksy. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. Just like, fuck, fucking a man. (laughs) I I love those. Those are, those are supposed to be like throwaway lines that are just perfect. They, they, they keep the movie kind of moving and keep it fresh for uh, people of all ages. And I, I I love that moment. So funny. Cause, cause, cause yeah. Like, how would you react if you saw this shit? You know, you'd be like, what in the fuck? I think it's a Banksy. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, most people under the age of, you know, whatever, 15 are going to have no idea what's happening there. Uh, but as you get older, you, you know, you learn, of course, of the, the artist, the street artist, Banksy. It's just really funny. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I love the little random lines of dialogue from bystanders. Like when during Peter's um, funeral and everyone's in Spider-Man masks and MJ says something like, it's up to you. And Miles is like, it's up to me. And the guy next to him, like, it's probably a metaphor, but I, I like the attitude. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Just perfect. Just incredible. Yeah. Uh, I love it so much. Uh <laughs> Oh man, the score and the soundtrack for Spider Spider Verse is strong. So this is probably the most difficult decision I had to make. The Ennio Morricone Award. What do you got? Uh, I picked um, the introduction of Uncle Aaron using Notorious B.I.G.'s "Hypnotize." Perfect. Uh, Because I'm like, that's a perfect song to introduce this guy who is hypnotizing Miles in his, you know. He's 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 cool when his dad is, you know, strict and he's he's all, you know, he's excited about the the graffiti and he's he's someone Miles can talk to. He's you know, he's hypnotizing him. In reality, he's the prowler. He's a monster who works for the Kingpin. But I thought that was a great song choice. I love hearing Biggie in a fucking superhero movie. And uh, yeah, it was just it was a cool moment. Yeah. Yeah. Great pick. I definitely thought about that one. And Mahershala Ali just spot on. He's yeah. spot on for Uncle Aaron. Really, really cool. I love that the contrast between those two, uh, the dad and, and Uncle Aaron. Very cool. I love, Great pick. I, I love that Blade will be the third comic book character he has played. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, but this will be the best. This will be the. Yeah. I cannot cannot wait. Perfect. What do you got? Uh, I, yeah, I, I change my mind all you know about this one a bunch. You know, there's a lot of cool artists like you you mentioned. Big uh, Denzel Curry's the guy who's in it. Uh, Vince Staples, Plus Malone, Sway Lee, Jaden Smith, Juice World, Lil Wayne. Uh, just a lot of a lot of great stuff. But I I had to kind of go with my uh, my heart here. And again, my daughter Willow loves this movie, and she. Loves Sunflower. She loves that song. And uh, there's like a few songs that she responds to and is just like happy. It's just like really, really happy. And I love seeing, of course, I love seeing my daughter happy. So I chose Sunflower by Post Malone and Sway Lee. Uh, kind of like the, the poster song for this movie. He uh, at one point is told like, go to your happy place, try to stay calm. And he starts like kind of humming and singing it in the movie. Uh, Miles does. And it's just a just a fun fucking song, catchy as shit. Uh, and I, I, it's probably a song on you know if I s- just heard it and it wasn't on the movie, or I didn't have uh, you know a beautiful daughter, I probably wouldn't look the, you know I probably wouldn't think twice. But because she feels so strongly about it, and it's such like a vile part of this movie that I love, I I just had to choose it. I think it's a, I think it's a wonderful song. I'm not I'm not even a big Post Malone guy. Definitely not a big Sway Lee guy, but this is a cool track. And again, very catchy, very, very good tune. I told you on the trip that I don't really care much for modern pop music, but I almost picked this one too. This is a catchy tune. Um, do you know if this was written for the movie? I think so. Uh, I'm pretty sure it is because even on Post Malone's album, I was like doing this research last night. Uh, at, at fucking 2 a.m. after seeing No Way Home, because we're recording this on Saturday night. Saw No Way Home, no Way Home last night, and uh, I was looking at it. It's on one of Post Malone's albums, so I think it was released for Spider-Man, and then he was like, fuck it, this is a cool track. I'm putting this on an album. Like, it's such a good... And, and you know, in, in Post Malone, he, his albums, I, I, I said I wasn't a big fan of his, but I've listened to all of his work. I like to listen to to people, even if I'm not super drawn to them. I like listening to their work just to kind of see for myself like why they're so popular and whatnot so i've listened to a lot of stuff a lot of my friends really like him and uh he's a he's a texas boy so i'm always kind of drawn to to those guys and 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 his albums are like get real dark and real happy and they just go through all these crazy emotions and that's one thing i really appreciate about him and this song is like right between these two kind of like tough songs and some flower plays in between so it's kind of cool it's kind of cool how he takes you on a journey he He's actually a like wonderful singer, Post Malone, and I've heard him cover like Bob Dylan, and he it's fucking brilliant. It's like genius stuff. This is just how he makes the most money. Is this kind of genre, you know, this kind of pop R and B rap type stuff, and it, it is what it is. You know, I'm not crazy about it, but he's he's talented. I found it here. It is. Um, it was released as a single from the soundtrack to Spider Verse. Weird that this didn't make it as a uh, best original song nominee. Yeah, that's that's kind of crazy, isn't it? Yeah. What was what was in there? Uh, well, okay. Shallow from Star is Born, All the Stars from Black Panther, I'll Fight from RBG, The Place Where Lost Things Go from Mary Poppins, and When a Cowboy Trades His Spurs for Wings from Buster Scruggs. That's a cool group of of songs. I would probably take out Mary Poppins and put that put that there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's it was released as a single uh, in 2018 and then he put it on his album Hollywood's Bleeding from 2019. Perfect. Yeah. Good pick. Good pick. Uh kind of like Miles's theme song. Correct. Yeah. And definitely when you hear that song you think of you think of Miles. Yeah. Have you um gotten to play the video game Spider-Man Miles Morales? No, I have not. It's pretty fun. Pretty short, but pretty fun. I would imagine. Yeah. All right. Um the Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yeah, the PSH. The good old Philip Seymour Hoffman. Might need to change it to Cooper Hoffman soon, god damn it. <laughs> yeah, there were moments of licorice pizza where I'm like, oh, that's daddy. Yeah, he cannot help it. When he says, uh, I can't help it. I'm a showman. <laughs> You're like, oh my God, that's Phil. 
let's fill let's fill <laughs> yeah i i hope i hope cooper uh well he like grew up with paul thomas anderson's kids right they're they're they're, they're always good buddies pta and, and and phil and now he's been able to kind of take cooper under his wing which is is like wrecks me just wrecks me being a fan of being a huge fan of psh and knowing that cooper's like being taken care of he's a little bit older than paul thomas anderson's oldest oldest kid and he's they've kind of just grown up together very cool yeah it's touching uh there's a lot of options for this one uh the voice talent in this movie is through the roof um but i had to go just the way this character is written uh jake johnson is peter b parker that's what i chose holy shit (laughs) He, God, uh, he's dynamite. He's hilarious. I love this this idea of a Spider Man that like, you know, divorced Mary Jane, got depressed, got a gut, got a shitty apartment, and gave up, and then is like reinvigorated by Miles Morales and is kind of forced to be a, t- a mentor. It's it's great, and Jake Johnson does a great job just playing the Spider Man who really is like on his last fuck. Yeah. <laughs> yep, he doesn't. He's got one left and he's using it to help miles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love the, I love, I love that he like eats a cheeseburger and then eats another one right away. <laughs> and, and then he's like, all right, I got to like relax before I go out there and, you know, sling a bunch of webs. <laughs> so it, yeah, he is spectacular uh, in the wrong hands. This character could like ruin the movie. Um, but Jake Johnson just fucking gets it. He like totally understood what they were going for. Uh, he's he's lights out. But yeah, this could have gone to anybody, literally anybody. Nicholas Cage, Leah Schreiber, John Mulaney, Catherine Hahn. Uh, I I love Brian Terry, Henry Marshall. Uh, everybody's great. I love when he meets Mary Jane from this universe and has a bit of a panic attack, and she she thinks he's a waiter and wants more bread, and he's like, "I'm sorry, I couldn't be there for you." to give you bread (laughs) like and he has that kind of breakdown yeah and gwen has to be like we'll be right there (laughs) ma'am he's like it's okay it's no big deal like whenever you can he's like i wasn't there for you (laughs) oh jake johnson's a funny son of a bitch yeah he is i i i I really really like him anytime even if it's like not a great movie he's one of those guys who's just just kind of fun to watch uh I think the first time I really like took note of who he was was when I saw back in 2013 or somewhere in there, 2012, 2013, uh, Drinking Buddies with him and uh, uh, Olivia Wilde and Ron Livingston. Just, it's just, a, just a good, good, good movie. Solid, solid, entertaining film. And he's just fantastic in it. And from there on out, I was like, I like this guy. I really like this guy. He's great. I liked his brief bit in jurassic world as like the guy who's like the you know the old park that was where it's at like the original park was the was the shit and he's like wearing the shirt and they're like take that off like why would you wear that and he's like i got this for like 50 bucks on ebay it's a weird character but it 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 makes me laugh yeah those those movies don't have a whole lot going for it right and so you take you take the things you can you can get when he goes in for the kiss and she's like no no not not like that. He's like, I thought you were. It gets awkward real fast, and she's like, Oh, I wish I hadn't done this. <laughs> it just walks out. <laughs> <laughs> He's a walking trope subverter. I, I love him in uh in tag. He's just like a pothead. He's tag. fucking. He's fucking great in that movie. <laughs> tag was so funny. I, yeah, I, that got Underrated. no attention. I really enjoyed yeah. tag. <laughs> yeah, me too. Awesome cast. Yeah, <laughs> oh, good stuff. Yeah. Okay. I, I love it. I, I love I love seeing uh him and Hannibal Burris just talk about like oh and Hannibal Burris is like time is a construct, man. Yeah. <laughs> what time is it? I don't have a watch. I don't know. Time is a construct. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I like that movie. I saw that in theaters and I had a blast. Did I see that with you? No, I saw it on DVD. I okay. I love when they're like uh what she's Episcopalian. It's like, what does that mean? <laughs> Jake Johnson's like, means she can't eat fish. Hannibal's like, that's pescatarian. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, this is a completely different conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> 
All right, man. Uh, fi- final award, uh, the Roger Deakins. What do you got? This was uh, pretty easy once the scene happened. Um, it's when Miles finally steps up, you know, goes to Aunt May's house. And she's like, took you long enough and gives him a suit and he, sp- you know, makes it his own and he becomes Spider-Man. Like not just a Spider-Man, but the Spider-Man for this universe. Like he's stepping into Peter Parker's shoes. He becomes, you know, he jumps off the building, all, all of that, that whole scene. And then up to him going to the collider and saving the day. It's just such a great, you know, hero, like uh, call to action moment. That just is great because we're waiting for it the whole movie. We're waiting for him to stop being a kid and realize that how high the stakes are and accept this responsibility. And when he does, it's great. Yeah. That's an epic, epic moment. I always get chills. And I love, I love Lily Tomlin's Aunt May. Like so good. She's yeah. wonderful. That's that that's actually that's actually where my 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 deacons also takes place at Lily Tomlin's uh Aunt May's house. And it's when we get introduced to all the Spider-Man's. Ah. And <laughs> uh that's that's when we hear they're they're in the basement and we see noir spider-man nicholas cage and they're like is there wind blowing isn't this a basement <laughs> and he's like everywhere i go the wind's blowing <laughs> uh, and it smells like rain <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah we see john Mulaney spider ham we see gwen you know we see all these different you know and this is a this is a the appetizer before before what we're about to see in the Spider-Man world, right? It's like, of course, of course, you know, again, this is not a spoiler. You've seen in the trailer that shit's going to get get wild and things are going to collide. I, I, I think they had to see it kind of work on a smaller scale. And then they were like, let's take this to the next fucking level, you know? And yeah, that's where we're, that's where we're at now. And I, I love, I love the idea of multiple Spider-Mans being in the same room and from different universes and, it's so unique the, the voice cast they get for those those characters in this movie and uh I, I i love miles attitude towards it all he's just like what the fuck is happening you know it's re- it's just a really really cool moment and then again aunt may lily tomlin's aunt may is kind of like gritty and it's awesome like it's much different than what we're used to with aunt may oh but she she fucking kicks tombstone's ass out of her house <laughs> yeah that, that was hilarious yeah <laughs> great yeah. stuff great stuff yeah, her, her house, her house is where it's all at, man. That's where all the big stuff happens. I love that this Peter has a layer, like has you know a like a bat cave almost. Like that was really cool. We never really gotten to see Spider Man have a a, a a base, uh, but this is a Spider Man who's been at it for like decades. We've never seen that before. A Spider Man who's been in the game for quite some time, and uh, I hope we get to see that live action at some point. Yeah, me too. Me too, man. Really special. Oh man, all things Spidey are just hitting on all cylinders right now. You know, it's everything is definitely working and it's very cool to be a part of. It's very cool because he's my he's my favorite superhero character, my favorite comic book character of all time. And I love just kind of being able to be here for it. I definitely Batman's my favorite, but I grew up with Spider-Man. I've got a big, you know, place in my heart for Spider-Man. Uh so yeah, I, I, I've, I've been really loving this week of, of podcasts, getting to focus on as much of Spider-Man as we can. Yeah, straight up, man. It's, 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 it's an honor, to be honest with you. <laughs> it's, that, that, that's the best way I can put it. And uh, next week is uh, the biggest honor I can have uh, for Oscar Sunday. Uh, as, as, you, as you guys uh, have caught on, and you've known since you've known me, Connor, that Paul Thomas Anderson is guy he is my my fair director and his movie licorice pizza will be out in most most theaters you know most most states across the united states uh so people can go go check it out so next week on oscar sunday we, we got to do one of his movies and the one i chose to do is the master from 2012 so that will be that will be episode 82 here on oscar sunday next week please come back and check it out on um sneak preview tomorrow of course no way home. It's going to be all things Spider-Man again. So if you want to hear a more, you know, a spoiler zone and hear Connor and Caleb just fucking dive into that shit, 
please check it out. Uh, that's, that's going to be really unique and really excited to hear you and Caleb. I I've texted you both separately about, and Caleb is just freaking out. So I can't wait to kind of hear you guys talk in person about, about everything. Uh, and then, uh, it, with it being, you know, Christmas week, um, uh, Christmas is less than a week away. Uh, we're, we're, we're going to be doing silent night, deadly night. Uh, that'll be Connor and Caleb on film gasm on, December 22nd on Wednesday. So please check that one out too. It's going to be a fun week. Lots of fun. And, uh, you know, I, I would like to, uh, shout out our, our social media, if you can, you know, try to follow us on uh, Twitter at filmgasm and uh, also at filmgasm on Instagram, if you can, uh, we'd love to interact with you guys in more ways than just podcasting. So give us a shout, maybe give us a recommendation for something you want us to do on, on our shows. And we're always right here. Hell yeah. Um, uh- also check out the website, uh, filmgasm.com. Of course, the hub. Always got shit going on. Reviews, articles, trailers, podcasts. If you want to just go ahead and listen to it there, you can. Every episode we've ever done is on the website. Um, and I do want to announce that on Wednesday's Filmgasm, uh, Caleb and I will be announcing a fourth show uh, that we will be premiering in January. Uh, so tune in then to find out all about this new thing. We've been teasing it throughout Filmgasm, throughout Sneak Preview. You probably caught on if you put the pieces together what this show is going to be about. Uh, I'm so excited. We've already re- uh, recorded the pilot, and we have a very cool idea of what this is going to be, and we, we can't wait. So tune in Wednesday, Silent Night, Deadly Night, to find out all about that. Uh, yeah, wonderful week. And uh, The Master will be our last Oscar Sunday of 2021. Uh, so we'll say our farewells for a new year next week. Yeah. I cannot wait, man. I've been waiting for this movie for, since we started the show. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm honestly surprised we haven't gone through Anderson's entire catalog at this point. <laughs> well, you know, we, we've done boogie nights. Yeah. We can't do hard eight. Uh, we cannot do punch drunk love. Uh, those would have to be on film gasm or, or we'd have to do them another way. Uh, there'll be blood. Of course that's going to come up at some point it's an absolute masterpiece uh we could do inherent vice at some point we could do phantom thread uh and licorice pizza we'll see yeah he's got a varied uh was punk drunk punch drunk not up for anything no fucking shame how is adam sandler not up for best actor in that movie get the fuck out i thought it was up for screenplay did i make did i imagine that let's double check on that but i feel like it wasn't um in the process um no it wasn't god damn yeah. i i'd always thought that was up for screenplay huh i guess i just uh, yeah i guess i pulled that out of my ass all right well yeah <laughs> luckily we've got a place for that movie because it is weird and worth talking about on filmgasm at some point uh 100 kick ass so you know spider-man tomorrow silent night deadly night on wednesday new show announcement on wednesday very excited the master next week Ban, fucking tastic. Uh, see you then. Yeah, peace.